Let me uh, be the first to welcome you to the uh, Sonosite webinar on diagnostic shoulder exams, uh, specifically for the lateral shoulder. Uh, before we begin, please be advised all attendees are muted and you may type your questions into the Q&A box in the toolbar located at the bottom or the side of your screen. I will conduct that Q&A session at the end of the presentation and demonstration. And this webinar will be recorded and archived for future reference. Uh, so uh, with us today is Daniel Shelton. Uh, Daniel Shelton is the Director of Musculoskeletal Market Development for Fujifilm Sonosite. Daniel spent 16 years as a dedicated musculoskeletal, excuse me, musculoskeletal sonographer, and 10 of those years have been here at Sonosite. Uh, he now leads musculoskeletal market development, where he works to spread the word about the benefits of point-of-care ultrasound. Uh, so Daniel, I'll go ahead and turn it over to you, and we can get started. All right. Thank you, Chris, for that introduction. I want to welcome everybody again. This is the lateral shoulder. This is a running part of our four-part series. This is part two. If you did not catch the anterior shoulder, I encourage you to go back through our uh, webinar library and get caught up on the anterior shoulder and the associated artifacts with musculoskeletal ultrasound, such as anisotropic artifact or angle artifact. Uh, we'll discuss a little bit of that here, but it was more in depth in the first of the four part series. So um, with that said, a little bit of um, background about what we're going to be talking about today. Um, th there's a lot going on in the lateral shoulder, and we're, we're, we're going to cover these slides really quickly. And then we're going to spend the majority of our time on the live demo. And then uh, hopefully a heavy amount of time on the Q&A with your questions and maybe anything that you want clarified in the live demo um, would be best addressed in the Q&A. So have those questions ready, have them uh, typed out in the chat portal or the Q&A portal for Chris to address. Uh, he'll, he'll tally those up and we'll run them through in the Q&A portion. But you're going to see a lot of diagrams. You're going to see a lot of anatomy, ultrasound images depicted in here. I'm not going to read from the slides. I'm going to breeze through these slides as quickly as I know how to. But um, just know that this is recorded and you can go back through the recording and use these um, and pause uh, these videos as a diagram for you to scan along. I encourage that you, you go through these slides, you hit the pause button and you try to achieve the scanning targets that are uh, discussed in each slide and that will help be a very nice scan along. Um, so let's go ahead without any further ado and you'll notice I have an anatomy image up here depicted already. And this is the shoulder, not in anatomical position. This is the modified crass position. And it's very important to scanning the lateral shoulder. In the anatomical position, we're um, slightly externally rotated. And you'll see that the greater tuberosity would typically be sitting out here laterally underneath the acromion uh, for the most part. So what we have to do uh, to bring out these cuff structures, like the supraspinatus and infraspinatus, away from the acromion is we have to rotate the shoulder this way. And we just tell people to either place their palm in their back pocket. Um, the, the, the real key here is to not let there be much of a gap between the elbow and the rib cage. So what we're doing is a couple of things, and we'll do this in the live demonstration, is we've taken the greater tuberosity from a lateral superficial structure, okay, to this anterior and deeper structure. And we did that by internally rotating and dragging the elbow back posteriorly, which is not not super evident here. So when we rotate the model, uh, both anatomical uh, model and the photograph, we see how far back this elbow goes. If your patient's not able to do that, it's okay. Start in a fairly neutral, um, just arm slightly uh, internally rotated and, and pull the elbow back maybe to the outside of their thigh and just see what kind of range of motion you can get away with. But look at the stretching that's occurred on the supraspinatus anteriorly. The infraspinatus follows as it overlaps the supraspinatus by a third. Teres minor follows much more inferiorly, and we'll talk about those, especially in the live scan. Uh, but there is a twisting anteriorly and a dropping of the greater tuberosity inferiorly. So we've, we've taken the greater tuberosity from an anatomical position, which would face us here, and we've wrapped it anteriorly and dropped it inferiorly, and that's going to dramatically change where our transducer would be located. If you looked at a traditional anatomy diagram, I think you would assume that your transducer would be placed very lateral for a rotator cuff exam. And just know from a patient positioning standpoint, any surface landmarks have now changed from uh, where we put our probe. So we're not going to be focused on the lateral anatomical shoulder. We're, we're looking at lateral structures, but we're going to have the probe very anterior. 
anytime I'm evaluating major tendons, I start in a short axis. So we're going to go straight into the short axis transduce replacement for the supraspinatus, which is here. And we can see this rounded oval um, of the supraspinatus. It's cut in half. This is your sagittal MRI uh, equivalent. Here's the coracoid process as a landmark. So the medial side of the transducer screen right is the patient's medial side. Uh, just under the fingers of this photo, and that's where the coracoid is going to be. And then what you're going to do is just windshield wiper over uh, until you see the humeral head, typically. And if the humeral head is not sharp and crisp, the rest of these structures are not going to look very good either. Here's that familiar biceps tendon. If you do not see the biceps tendon, don't move forward with this exam. We need to see the biceps tendon if it's there. If they're postoperative and had a tenodesis or something like that, keep that in mind. Uh, but we're really looking for the biceps because its next lateral landmark here is the supraspinatus. There are other structures that we'll talk about uh, toward the end of the slides uh, between the biceps and the supraspinatus, but for now let's focus on this leading edge of the supraspinatus. That's where all the pathology happens for the most part. Infraspinatus won't be so heavy this slide deck, but we will discuss it a little bit. But we've cut the rotator cuff in half, and we're looking down the fibers as a sagittal MRI equivalent. Now let's colorize these, these structures, and I've got part of the transducer on the coracoid and the other part of the transducer on the acromion process, and this makes up our transducer placement for the proximal supraspinatus. So this is where the musculotendinous junction is, and we can see the central tendon of the supraspinatus and the muscle fibers following um, of the very proximal edge of what we consider to be something to look at. But here's your corcoacromial ligament. If it's dipping or sagging, we've got volume loss, and that's something to look for here. This is also a good position to do wagging of the elbow for any adhesions that may, have, may occur in the subacromial bursa to that corcoacromial ligament. And we can look at that in the live scan. Again, leading edge of the supraspinatus is our focus for these slides. We'll get to the rest of the interval structures shortly, but supraspinatus and biceps tendon relationship is really important. It will not change as we fan this transducer distally down the greater tuberosity, and we're going to look for the shape of this humeral head to change. So unless you have a rounded humeral head, I don't want you to advance the transducer, okay? So we've advanced the transducer to this new white location here. You can see this, this big dot, just like in our last set of slides, and in the wrist is going to represent the left side of the screen. This thumb orientation marker in the transducer is the left side of the screen. So um, here we have the humeral head. It's nice and bright. Supraspinatus has this big oval leading edge appearance, and we're really just going to be focusing right here on the leading edge of the supraspinatus and transverse. Here's that biceps tendon for reference. As we fan distally, that's where a lot of things change. And as we go distally, we leave the, I'm going to go back to the humeral head. Let's look at these changes. We have the humeral head, which is rounded. We've not hit the greater tuberosity yet. And I see the articular hyaline cartilage here, and it's also capped here in blue in the illustration. But as I go further distal and drag the transducer, relatively speaking, towards the floor because of the arms rotation, um, watch the shape of the humeral head change. Cortical landmarks are number one in MSK because soft tissue changes so frequently, and that's what we're here to look at. Follow your bony landmark first. And what I'm going to do after I find a nice sharp cortex is I'm just panning, dragging, like a paintbrush, the transducer distally towards that ball shape of the shoulder, and we end up with this apex here, this bony peak of the anterior and the middle facets of the greater tuberosity. Here's the biceps tendon for reference. It's not so pro uh, prominent here because it's anisotropic. It has the angle artifact. It's not the focus of our exam right now. We're really focusing on making sure we don't have any anisotropy or angle artifact across the footprint of the supraspinatus tendon primarily. Infraspinatus tendon will be kind of a collateral concern at this point, but we're really, really focusing on these fibers here. You can see this dark rim here. You want to wag and tilt the transducer and try to get rid of this anisotropic artifact. Also, compression is, is very useful here. If you suspect a tear, uh, apply transducer pressure and see if you can't get the subacromial surface to collapse into the supraspinatus. Um, it's at this point that the supraspinatus actually... Um, has a, a very unique relationship with the infraspinatus. And I'm gonna go with the next slide to illustrate that. So here we are, this is a 3D CT on the greater tuberosity facets under the acromion process. And we're really focusing here on the anterior facet of the greater tuberosity, or the superior facet, I should say. Um, at that superior facet surface, we have primarily supraspinatus. 
uh, we will have about one third of the tendon fibers of the infraspinatus overlap the supraspinatus at this point. And you just want to sweep and scan proximally, distally, proximally, distally until you see this relationship. And as we scan more proximally, you'll actually see this diagonal line show up between the infraspinatus and supraspinatus. And we're going to show that in a live demo. We, we want to maintain this relationship to the biceps as much as we can, but that relationship leaves a little bit as we're in the interval and uh, we start to see this gapping between the biceps and supraspinatus. And we'll, we'll talk about the interval after the main supraspinatus slides, but just be aware of this cortical landmark, this apex of the greater tuberosity, uh, sometimes called the anterior facet or superior facet as illustrated here by uh, Dr. John Jacobson in the Fundamentals of Musculoskeletal Ultrasound book. Uh, it's in its third edition. I encourage everybody to give that a read. It is the, uh, it's the best handheld reference, uh, non-hardback, easy to travel with. Uh, it's a great read. It's not your typical radiology book. And I think you'll enjoy it. So um, this is a great illustration. It's just depicting that point with all the other stuff just decluttered, like the interval and the, the deltoid and its septations and things. It's just really um, simplified. So I enjoy that illustration a lot. And then overlying all of these structures, we have the subacromial subdeltoid bursa and its layers. And there are many layers. Going to long axis now, uh, we've we rotated the probe 90 degrees to a longitudinal plane to the supraspinatus. This is a coronal body plane. Uh, and then we're going to be panning the probe lateral and medial. We're looking at the humeral head to be rounded and the greater tuberosity to have this kind of parrot's beak. Uh, as I mentioned, the difference between the subscapularis and the supraspinatus is cortical landmark that I discussed uh, last week at the anterior shoulder demo was that a subscapularis, while it looks very similar, has a very flat beak so it's a bird's beak this is a parrot's beak it has a hooked bill if you want to get nerdy about how you remember these things that's one way to do it but it also identifies the actual footprint of the, the predominant supraspinatus uh here's some angle artifact we would tilt the probe and get get uh get that feathered out it's anisotropic artifact and i think if we just aim the beam back into the footprint you'd see that clear right up let's go into how to scan that Start at where the uh, the round ball of the shoulder meets the chest wall. There's this divot, and what you're not seeing back here is my fingers are are placed firmly in that divot of the shoulder where the chest wall meets the remainder of this ball shape of the shoulder. Set your transducer right on the outer ball shape, but what you want to do is just fan that transducer towards the fingers. And as you do that, you're going to come across this very deep humeral head, and the humeral head is going to have this irregular contour, but it should be smooth. You're going to see this arc shape with the fibers in it. That's the biceps tendon proximally that we scanned on the anterior shoulder. That is our landmark because in long axis, this biceps tendon is parallel to the supraspinatus tendon laterally. So as we pan this transducer laterally, we will immediately see the supraspinatus. So until we see the biceps tendon anteriorly, you will not be confident that you've, that you've evaluated the anterior margin of the supraspinatus. It's that that uh, has the most pathology. If you're not seeing this and you're not able to get this arc shape of the biceps tendon, uh, take a look at your patient's elbow. We'll do this in the live scan. But if it's wagged too far out like a chicken wing, you're not going to get it. You need to bring the elbow towards the spine and that will bring and externally rotate out this rotator cuff interval, which is where the biceps is. And we will get this landmark really nicely. So after that, we're going to pan the transducer about a centimeter lateral. And you'll see that the bony landmark has changed dramatically, more like that MRI contour slide that we looked at. So here we are just lateral. We're on the very peak of that ball shape of the skin surface, uh, the, if, if you can palpate that on your patient. Uh, we have the rounded humeral head and greater tuberosity. Greater tuberosity is in profile, and it's got this nice curve to it, like a ski jump, versus laterally. As we pan more and more laterally, you'll see it flatten out. If it flattens out like this, just be aware, most of these fibers are actually infraspinatus coming in from the posterior margin and be aware of any contour changes of the greater tuberosity. So there's a big difference in going from here to here and how that is shaped uh, because as we see this greater tuberosity flatten out, it means you've gone so far posterior, you're leaving the, uh, you're leaving the fibers of the predominant supraspinatus and right in here, which should be illustrated, but it's not, you start to see this, this overlapping wedge of anisotropic artifacts sometimes. Don't confuse that for a tear or pathology, that's infraspinatus. So um, let, let's move even further anterior from the supraspinatus. So here, we just got done evaluating this tendon in both short axis and long axis. And 
let's find out what what those parts were that were surrounding the biceps tendon. Uh, from the coracoid process, we have this overlying ligament that has many, many fibers going many different directions. Some go over the biceps groove, some go under the supraspinatus, some go over the supraspinatus, and that's the coracohumeral ligament. This acts as a stabilizing sling for the biceps. So it's not all up to the biceps groove to keep it from dislocating into the subscap. Um, a lot of the uh, strength, in fact, more often relies on this coracohumeral ligament in conjunction with the transverse humeral ligament, which is here. It's very broad and is more of an extension of the anterior subscapularis fibers. So uh, anterior subscapularis, which we evaluated last week, shares fibers and jumps over the biceps groove to create mostly that transverse humeral ligament, which blends in with the coracohumeral ligament. And these ligaments are the things that stabilize the biceps. So other things that may be pain generators or sources of instability in the shoulder um, and, and various other uh, uh, things to look for. Don't forget about these ligaments surrounding the biceps. So we're going to climb. Um, oh, actually, we're going to slice this and get more of a cross-sectional uh, view of what we're looking at. So we just got done evaluating the anterior supraspinatus and its cross-section. Uh, surrounding like a yin yang um, and, and like a hammock on each side bordering the biceps. The biceps pierces between this relationship of that superior glenohumeral ligament, which is acting like a hammock, and the coracohumeral ligament, which is uh, subtracted uh, quite a bit of transparency here, but it is uh, acting as this big broad bridge up and over the biceps, and they taper together along with the joint capsule to wrap around the biceps. And that's what keeps the biceps intra-articular is this joint capsule sling that is a, a part of this complex. So when you do a biceps tendon injection that's too proximal, you're gonna end up dumping it into the joint. And that's why you wanna go distal um, in the biceps groove when you do a joint inject, when you do a biceps sheath injection so that the rem remainder of your injection does not end up in the joint. If you have a large joint effusion of the glenohumeral joint, it's right here at this window that it will outpour into the bicep sheath. So if you see a huge effusion in the bicep sheath, you can almost 100%, uh, I think it's 90 something percent by Jacobson, uh, rely on there being some sort of rotator cuff tear that, that let fluid out into that uh, articulation of the biceps. Uh, let's take a look at how that images. So here we have the biceps tendon as this oval over the humeral head that is pretty rounded. It's irregular in shape because the biceps groove is kind of tapering away and we're about to hit the humeral head laterally. But the CHL and the SGHL are like this sling around the biceps. And we'll focus on that in the uh, live demo. But the, the graphics are here for your future reference um, so that we don't spend too much time. Um, one more thing before we go to the live demo, we have the subacromial subdeltoid bursal interface. And we'll be doing this predominantly in the live demo. But just know in a modified crass position, you can still see these layers really nicely. So this is all supraspinatus primarily from here to here, right where my mouse is starting and stopping. And then we have these other little soft tissue layers, and there are there are a lot. There, I think there's something like seven layers when you get to the peritoneon of the uh, supraspinatus, the periversal fat, the actual interface where the two structures are gliding on each other of the subacromial bursal potential space, and then you have the uh, the the subacromial fat of the uh, sub deltoid fascia, and then you have this the the peritoneon and uh, subdeltoid fascia of the deltoid. So. Uh, there's a lot of layers here to get your needle lost. So we're going to apply some dynamic maneuvering to make the interface of this uh, as clear and easy to see as possible. And then when you go into do your abduction maneuvers for impingement, it's going to be a relatively anatomical plane. And that's why we see the acromion here. We see the greater tuberosity so close in relation is that we're not going to stay in the modified crass position. We're going to go to anatomical position. Uh, relatively speaking, and we're going to abduct and watch this glide. But look at the teardrop. Look at the dependent recess of the subacromial subdeltoid bursa laterally. Uh, that that peribursal fat, that white interface of the subdeltoid fascia, it's, it's these layers that combine that have this redundant fold over the greater tuberosity laterally and uh, create this, this really nice pouch for free fluid to exist. And when we internally and externally rotate, abduct and uh and internally rotate and strain like the modified crass position this big redundant recess unfolds and allows us to have that that range of motion but it also fills with free fluid in the case of either bursitis or if you have some sort of cuff tear that goes from articular to um, bursal surface and we'll talk about that in the live scan but uh, it's just a couple words about uh, the the subacromial bursa and its interface and i think it's just better 
depicted in the live scanning. So um, what I'm going to do is go ahead and get set up for the live demonstration and kick it over to that. After the live demo, um, it will be time to answer your questions. So have those ready. Um, I know the slides were really fast, but we're going to try to predominantly spend the rest of the time in live scan so that um, those points can be driven home with a more dynamic study. Don't forget to use these, these slides in, uh, for future guidance on, on what those tissue layers are. Um, one second while I switch over. So just like on the uh, anterior shoulder, we started with the, the uh, patient facing the machine. I was standing behind the patient. That's really how I like to scan shoulders because I get to rest my palm up here. Uh, and the majority of all your pathology will take place within uh, roughly one inch of the acromion anyway. So we're not traveling far away from the acromion and that's why I like to rest my hand up there. So I'll be selecting the linear 15 megahertz transducer on the Sonocyte PX. I've got my system where I want it to be. I've tilted things where I would like it to be and all my controls are facing me nicely here. I'm going to keep the uh, left side of the screen to the patient's right or lateral here. And to start out with the supraspinatus exam, uh, just in case your patient is not able to do the, the full modified crass, I like to just take a spot peek first before we start stretching them into various positions. So I'm just going to start with the uh, probe over the acromion and out lateral. And, and here in this view, you're going to see a lot of things such as the um, subacromial bursa. You're going to be seeing the full volume of the supraspinatus in many cases. And um, it's just not necessary to go ahead and stretch the tendon and do any damage to something that may just be hanging on by a thread. So uh, what I see already is very nice is, I'm going to pull my arrow out. I see full volume of the rotator cuff. I'm going to bring my depth a little bit more shallow. And I see a nice smooth greater tuberosity. So proceeding forward is probably not super risky with doing a modified crass position. So I've, I've done just kind of this quick survey of volume and I'll go short axis as well and just make sure that we're not, we're not suspecting any big major tear. We're gonna be looking for subtle pathology here, in this case, a normal exam. Here's our biceps here, as our anterior landmark, and then here we have our anterior supraspinatus. So before you, you just look at the book or watch the video and decide that all your patients have to be stretched into that maximum level of uh, modified crass and putting any stress on the tendon, just keep in mind, you can see a whole lot of anatomy uh, just without stressing your, your patient's positioning. So I'm gonna add a bit more gel here. And uh, with that gel standoff, it's gonna allow me to do a nice subacromial view without collapsing the bursa. So while I'm here um, and not stressing the, the patient, let's just do a quick subacromial exam. And uh, what I'm gonna have our patient do is just slowly internally and externally rotate and wag the elbow a little bit, there we go. And then uh, what I'm looking at is this bursal interface. You can see the hypoechoic mind, between those two uh, layers of periversal fat, sub subdeltoid fascia here superficially, peritinon and, and periversal fat of the supraspinatus, you relax. And then uh, zooming in is a good idea when doing these, unless you have a higher frequency transducer, which we can get to um, after we do the, the basic exam. And I'm just gonna go ahead and zoom in on these layers. And then we'll do just very subtle internal and external rotation and watch those layers uh, show themselves. So. Um, in a normal subacromial subdeltoid bursa, we should just see this very, very thin line. And then um, if you're just eyeballing how thick should a subacromial bursa be, let's just relax. I'm going to come up here to the hyaline cartilage of the uh, humeral head here. And I should be able to eyeball that the subacromial bursa is not thicker than the articular hyaline cartilage. If it starts to get any thicker, it's time to pull the calipers out and measure uh, whether or not you have a suspected subacromial bursitis. And there's a lot of published findings on that thickness and just use your clinical impression. Does it compress? Is it effused or is it just synovitis? Put your color power Doppler on and see if it's inflamed um, or maybe something else is going on in the bursa. So uh, that's, um, that's one way to do a subacromial evaluation with internal and external rotation. I'm gonna hit 2D to escape my zoom. And now I'm gonna go um, long axis to the supraspinatus and we'll do the subacromial impingement. So if you've ever been frustrated by this view, find your AC joint first, which we'll get to here in two more webinars, and go laterally on the acromion process here. From this point right here, what I just want you to do 
is point the uh, lateral side of the probe anterior while pivoting and keeping the proximal side of the probe on the acromion. So I'm just going to windshield wiper anteriorly, keeping those two structures in view. Uh, we're relatively internally rotated in a neutral plane. And uh, the reason I say that is our patient's hand is in her lap and we're not out here in anatomical position. So when we're in anatomical position and the palm is forward, the greater tuberosity is extremely lateral and we see what we see in the anatomy books. But right now we're, we're seeing our patient's positions internally rotated. That's really important when it comes to doing any rotator cuff or any shoulder exam is which position is the arm in. And now I'm gonna have our patient um, not only just abduct, but abduct a little bit anteriorly. And we're gonna be watching that greater tuberosity glide and clear the acromion process. Now, one tip while, while scanning this, if you've ever been frustrated by doing this, is as they abduct, notice the deltoid is starting to contract. And when the deltoid contracts, it can bump your transducer. So you'll notice all the weight of my probe is right here on the acromion, and I'm relatively floating the lateral side of the probe out here, uh, letting, letting the rest of the arm come up to the transducer. But I can see this interface nicely. Uh, while that, that provides a really nice, um, consistent scanning surface, it also helps me know uh, with confidence that I'm not collapsing the bursal interface with the weight of my transducer. So I can come out here laterally, just relax, and um, I can get a beautiful subacromial shot, but I fell off the acromion, and now I'm collapsing any bursitis I may have, if it, or if it's simply diffused, um, you're gonna miss that. And, it, and, and if our patient abducts again, go ahead and abduct, that deltoid contraction is gonna bump my transducer sometimes um, off axis, and it makes it very hard to scan. So those are my scanning tips for a subdeltoid bursal uh, view there. In the Q&A portal, um, if you have questions about injections and where that needle should go, save those for the Q&A at the end. So from that subacromial exam and that, that non-invasive rotator cuff sweep, it's time to go ahead and stretch the rotator cuff tendon of the supraspinatus. And what I'm going to have our patient do is go into modified crafts, which is the palm in the back pocket. Um, if your stool doesn't have a backrest, that's a plus. If they do, sometimes they just have to scoot to the front of the stool. Um, but if, if your patient's comfortable in this position, it's going to be just fine. Actually, I'm going to have you scoot up just a touch. There we go. And the reason for that is we're going to be moving the elbow uh, just a little bit, and we want that free room back here. In modified crass, it's really important not to chicken wing out here. If, if you can get an arm through here, that's bad. If you can come up here and see that that gap has closed quite a bit, it's going to bring the rotator cuff structures lateral. And when we're internally rotated when we chicken wing out like that the cuff structures go in and under the coracoid process so i'm not able to see them so you have to externally rotate the shoulder in this position um, most people like to just go ahead and plop the probe onto long axis and just get right to the point well that's fine that's okay we're here to learn the scanning techniques of how to do this fairly thorough and i'm going to go short axis first so remember the anatomy diagram we pulled the structures anteriorly and inferiorly i'm going to take this slice right here across that anterior humeral head putting the um, medial side of the probe towards the chest wall, almost touching it completely. In fact, in this case, I am. I'm gonna bring my depth down just a touch so that I can see that biceps. I'm gonna check the gain on our, uh, on our webinar and soften that up just a touch real quick before we really get going. There we go. I kind of like that for what's being broadcasted. Um, let's bring our arrow back up and start pointing some things out. If I'm fanning the medial side of the probe over to a coracoid, it's this big prominence here. I'm going to fall off into the biceps tendon here. So I've located the biceps anteriorly. And then as I move laterally, I can see the anterior margin of the supraspinatus that we identified earlier here. Really nice. And then I'm going to keep traveling posteriorly until I see that, um, that tapering edge between the musculotendinous junction and the infraspinatus, which will be this diagonal little line right here between the two over the articular hyaline cartilage level. As we go out more distally, follow the anterior part of the supraspinatus only, and make sure you keep the biceps tendon in view. Okay, so we're gonna follow the biceps and the anterior margin of the supraspinatus first. Remember, the cortex needs to be nice and bright for this view. I need to see articular hyaline cartilage also. And what I'm gonna do is just pull the probe almost towards the floor obliquely, and I need to see the cortex change shape See the tendon, the overlying tendon is also changing direction. And I need to drop the handle of the probe, drop the handle of the probe, and I'm just walking down the humerus greater tuberosity. Did you see the, the transducer tilt as I pivoted distally? So let's do that again. 
We're going to go to the articular hyaline cartilage level. I'm going to go distal. You'll see the tendon disappear. I need to drop the handle back into the tendon. Go distal, see the tendon disappear. Drop the handle back into the tendon. You're going to keep walking that down. We did something really similar in the carpal tunnel webinar when it came to the, all the anisotropic connective tissue artifacts that we had within the tunnel. Here's our biceps anteriorly to make sure that we're not um, losing our, spe our spot, our lighthouse. And then you can see that, that anterior or superior facet right here, as it's called, um, of the greater tuberosity, that bony apex we saw in the anatomical diagram. And you can see the infraspinatus back here, uh, jumping over about a third of the uh, supraspinatus's posterior margin here. So we're gonna sweep up and down that footprint right here. And we're gonna just be evaluating that leafy, feathery edge of the supraspinatus and um, using sometimes anisotropic artifact to our advantage. Healthy tendon will turn dark. Okay, old scars, old dense collagen um, backfill of scar will not turn dark and it will remain um, echogenic as you sweep the probe through. So what I'm doing is I'm just kind of panning through the tendon. And as you see me cause the anisotropic artifact, I'm just tilting the transducer back and forth through the artifact, making sure that whole tendon fills and the whole tendon gets dark. I'm going distally again, making sure the whole tendon fills and the whole tendon gets dark. And I'm going distally all the way to the very edge to make sure the whole thing is remaining nice and, uh, well, anisotropic where, where it helps us. Uh, maintaining our anterior uh, biceps here, going through the interval. Uh, that, that, would, that would be me scanning through a short axis supraspinatus. Now what I'm going to do is come back to the articular hyaline level here. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tuck my transducer towards the chest wall. And I have the biceps tendon here in the, in the middle of the image. And I'm going to spin the probe. I'm going to put the left side of the screen towards the floor or the patient's right. Uh, and what this does is just keeps, uh, keeps us in line with a, a traditional MRI. Um, I know not everybody on the, on the call today is um, reading MRIs or trying to keep things correlated to an MR, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to keep that there for consistency with some of our other material. So look how anterior and medial I am. I'm almost laying the transducer up against that chest crease, okay? And I'm maintaining a 90 degree perpendicularity to the biceps tendon, and then you can see the back half of uh, what would be the, the, the humeral head. Now I'm going to follow this arc of the biceps. So this is distal, and you can use the anisotropic artifact and see that familiar structure that we looked at last week. Check it out. Biceps tendon, climbing intraarticular here. Okay, so there's the intraarticular biceps as it's traveling down. And some people, we can actually see it tapering into that superior glenoid tubercle with the, the superior labrum, but we're not going to focus on that just now. Uh, let's follow the biceps as our landmark. Okay, so now I'm going to take this, this orientation here laterally, and I'm going to drag the transducer laterally because in, it's in this, like we talked about in the PowerPoint, um, the biceps runs parallel with the supraspinatus. Okay, so I'm just going to drag the transducer laterally, of about a centimeter really is all. And there I can see the supraspinatus, just like we saw on the slides. Another scanning pearl here is if you're in a true long axis to the supraspinatus, uh, your, your superficial fibers here, the deltoid, that anterior deltoid will also be in long axis. So, so take a look at that as just something that you can do to check your work. Uh, if you have nice long axis deltoid fibers in this position, not all of the uh, positions get you that, but it's, a, it's kind of a neat way to check your work here. So we're going to follow the supraspinatus fibers uh, distally until they insert on the anthesis of the greater tuberosity. Let's cause an anisotropic artifact. So if I don't tilt the transducer at all, I get this wedge. And this is not pathology. This is healthy tendon insertion. See how the greater tuberosity is smooth? If it were jagged, like somebody had taken a bite out of it, if I, if I saw a pull lesion, I'd be really, really uh, suspect of this dark area, but it's smooth. Not only is it smooth, I don't see an overlying volume loss. So this tendon is occupying this space. If it stops occupying the space, like if this, if this tears and retracts back, um, something has to fill that void. And what fills that void is the overlying subacromial subdeltoid bursa. So when that happens, we get this big dip. We no longer get this parrot's beak looking bill. And we get this big flattened um, supraspinatus tendon. And a lot of times the deltoid will just sit on the greater tuberosity. So this I'm already suspecting to be artifact. And watch me angle the transducer this way. And when I angle the transducer back into the footprint, you see all that tendon fill in. And this is really important that you scan posteriorly to the flattening of the greater tuberosity and anteriorly 
to the curvature of the anterior greater tuberosity because that's where the tears happen. And uh, I'm going to check my work again as I went to the anterior greater tuberosity. I'm going to watch the greater tuberosity fall. And that's how you know you're going to enter the biceps groove, basically. But I'm going to follow this part right here where tuberosity meets humeral head. And we should see that arc shape of the biceps as I go more anterior there. So there's our anterior marker, our reference point, our lighthouse to make sure that we've evaluated the anterior supraspinatus. So we did short axis. We did long axis. Make sure you're letting up on pressure so that you're not collapsing any pathology. That's also very important. Um, when I'm doing these and I suspect a big tear or even a subtle tear, if I see something that looks like it may collapse, what I'm doing is I'm just gonna let up pressure and I can see where the gel was on the shoulder and, uh, or where it's not because my probe was pressing down and I put down a bead of gel right on that square. And then I'm lay, laying my finger down underneath the transducer surface to act as like a stilt so that I can lay the probe into the gel first and get this really, really pretty view of the supraspinatus without compression. So see how the deltoid is not compressed? The subacromial subdeltoid bursa is not compressed. And if I had any uh, suspect of any tears here, I would not be collapsing that useful pathology either. So just a little scanning tip that you can kind of pick up here and there. Uh, that one has helped me a lot um, along the way. Go ahead and relax. I'm sure our model's very happy to relax at that point. That concludes that supraspinatus exam. I'm just going to move to the rotator cuff interval now. So I'm going to have our patient just hang her arm out to the side and the arm slightly externally rotated. And then I'm going to place the transducer at the acromion first. And there where I see the acromion drop off to the humeral head here, I'm going to follow the biceps tendon. So anterior slightly, there we go. Now when you see the biceps tendon is suspended up in the air, or not in the air, into this connective tissue, use the anisotropic artifact to your advantage. First we're going to zoom, and uh, because we have the convenience of, of uh, 19 megahertz, we're going to be checking out the rotator cuff interval at a high frequency. So I like where my zoom box is, so I'm just going to hit zoom again. That was, that was easy. Okay, so here I am, I'm going to bring my arrow back up. Here's the biceps tendon right in the interval, and here we have the superior glenohumeral ligament, just like the anatomy diagram showed. Okay, we see subscap fibers way down here, superior glenohumeral ligament suspending the biceps like a hammock, tapering. There's some joint capsule in here that we don't see. And then here's the uh, corcohumeral ligament complex, and it's quite the large ligament. Uh, basically, you can see with very little toggling of the transducer, I'm going to follow using this, this angle artifact to my advantage. I'm going to follow this stripe above the biceps to the anterior footprint of the supraspinatus here. Okay. And then I'm also going to be following some of those fibers to the uh, superficial margin of the supraspinatus too. So these fibers really envelop the anterior supraspinatus here like a sling. A lot of the underneath fibers will, will, will even be traceable proximally to another structure that's a little bit more detailed and we can cover in the, in the Q&A, but we won't cover now. Or I'll get way off topic, but uh, back to the biceps and the superior or the uh, coracohumeral ligament. Um, that's that's pretty much it. So once you fell off of the acromion, look for that humeral head, then look for the biceps tendon. Um, you're not going to see articular hyaline cartilage under here very well, and you're going to be seeing a ligamentous structure. And, and like I think this looks like a yin yang, the sling around the biceps. There, there's clearly this directionality. Uh, enveloping top and bottom of the biceps. This is your rotator cuff interval. So by definition, we have subscap here. We have the superior glenohumeral ligament here. And then we're going to see the sling of this complex of that coracohumeral ligament dragging over to the supraspinatus here. And then uh, if we see any anterior disruptions on the supraspinatus, we're always going to be highly suspect that this coracohumeral ligament may also be involved. There's a few other dynamic maneuvers that we can do. Uh, putting those ligaments into long axis and, and internally and externally rotating and, and stretching these ligaments. But those are things that they need to correlate with your clinical reason for why they're there and, and they don't really uh, fall under the, the basic exam. But um, hopefully this, this helps kind of demystify what it did for me uh, when I learned about the rotator cuff interval. Uh, let me zoom out. I was always pretty good at getting this view, the anterior supraspinatus. I was always really good at getting the subscapularis and I was always really good at getting the biceps to look really, really cool floating between the two. But I, I knew there was just something here and there was something here in, the, in my early days of learning rotator cuff ultrasound. 
I never identified it. I knew there was a normal space here and a normal space here of connective tissue that I, I just, I, you know, I was never taught uh, super early on that these were uh, ligaments acting as a sling complex and that, uh, and that they actually are responsible for a lot of the bicep stability in the groove. Uh, and it takes a lot of pressure off that uh, transverse humeral ligament, you know? Uh, so from a, a body mechanic standpoint, this is really the, this is really the structure responsible for a lot of your bicep stability. Um, so with that, we, we've covered our supraspinatus in depth, and I feel like we've gone through the rotator cuff interval and it's a little complex, uh, pretty in depth. And we also did some subacromial uh, subdeltoid bursa scanning. Um, so I think at, at this point we could um, turn it over uh, back to Chris. And if Chris could, let me know if there's any questions in the in the in the chat portal. I think we'll we'll go from there and answer your questions live. Uh, go ahead and put your uh, questions and answer or the questions in the uh, Q and A box at the bottom or the right side of the screen. Um, I'll go ahead and uh, wait around for a little bit and see if any of those come in. I said I would go into 19 megahertz at the interval, and I didn't. So until we get some questions, I'm just gonna I'm gonna play around at the L19 five higher frequency transducer in that rotator cuff interval. Yep, I'll go ahead and share that on our screen here. Looks like you're up now. There we go. So why not, right? So just feel free to interject with questions, but you know, I always say if your patient size permits a higher frequency and you have a higher frequency, use the higher frequency. Like don't don't stick with the standard transducer just because it's what you've always done. Uh, you'd be really surprised what you're able to see. You turn that gain down. Well, that, that's coming in hot. I love Zoom. But um, just to give you an idea of what we're seeing at, at, at a little bit higher uh, clarity here, that superior glenohumeral ligament is now really big. Um, we can actually see more fibers of the corcohumeral, I believe. And then let's let's check out this anisotropic artifact diving down to the anterior greater tuberosity that is still corcohumeral ligament. See, so you'd be surprised how much of this is actually uh, suspending the supraspinatus up, and we can see that because the beam of a higher frequency transducer is thinner. It's a little bit more responsive to an, uh, uh, anisotropic artifact, right? So this thin horizontal line is actually holding up that supraspinatus tendon a little bit. And it's got another name. Uh, it starts to get into the rotator cuff cable. If we were to keep going proximally, um, let's go distally now and get into the biceps again. And I think we did this last week. And look at that transverse humeral ligament now in the fibers that you can see there. So like I said, if, if you have a higher frequency transducer, why not why not give it a shot? And you just be amazed at, at how much you see. You might find that one little pain generator that's poking on a nerve, if it's a superficial little nerve or something like that. Um, in this case, in the rotator cuff, um, the supraspinatus turns out really, really nice. We'll do that modified crass at 19 megahertz because, like I said, why not? I mean, we have the 19 megahertz in hand, and why not uh, fan across those and thesis fibers all the way to the anterior shoulder. I mean, this looks really nice. I mean, you normally don't even see lateral epicondyle fibers that big and pretty. And here we are at a uh, supraspinatus, which is usually just a um, linear striated, fairly heterogeneous group of fibers because these fibers run in so many different directions. I mean, how about relax and maybe we'll play around in some of the subacromial bursal layers until maybe somebody wants to throw a question out there. If not, I do understand everybody's time is very valuable. We went over on time. I've, I've gone through all the core content for the day, but if there's anything else that you wanted to see or maybe we can answer uh, any questions um, about the 19 megahertz transducer or maybe the, uh, the newly released Somosite PX that I am scanning with, uh, we would be happy to discuss those. Here. So I'm going to internally and externally rotate the transducer, or sorry, the, the shoulder. And let's look at those bursal layers superficial to the tendon. Because a lot of times these things can, um, the subacromial bursa can kind of blend in 
with the surrounding environment here. So uh, we did I'm get a uh, question come in. Uh, they yeah. ask, uh, how about the AC joint? So we will have um, that webinar, I believe is mid June. Is that right, Chris, where we go over the, the superior shoulder? Yes, I um, believe that's correct. I, I briefly covered it on how to find your subacromial space, which is still relevant here. So here I am superiorly, I've got my finger hanging down and I can feel the AC joint here. So what I'm gonna do is just plop the probe down and let my finger right over the groove of the AC joint or the, the that palpable bump. And then there's the AC ligament right here. And I'm just gonna jump, follow the acromion laterally, laterally, laterally. And like I said, on the, on the front of the shoulder, let's point that probe this way because we're internally rotated. And then let's check out that subacromial space and its layers, which is here. So we have uh, supraspinatus muscle, tendon, and peritinon and periversal fat and actual bursa, periversal fat, subdeltoid fascia, and then the deltoid. So we have all these layers and let's slowly chicken wing just a little to show the layers and then down. And then we'll go up again and then down it doesn't take much to just delineate the layers. If you're having a hard time, where do I put my needle? I don't want to give a little deltoid injection. And here, here's another, uh, another tip is if you're going to do a subacromial injection, going in the long axis can actually be a little misleading. So let me go to the broader field of view, L15, four megahertz transducer, and we'll scan the subacromial in two directions. And I'll show you a beneficial way to do these injections. If you're if you're doing an injection in long axis to the to the rotator cuff structures, you can actually accidentally go in just a little too superficial and hit one of these strands of the deltoid. You may see one of these bright white stripes because remember I said scanning the rotator cuff supraspinatus, the deltoid runs parallel, right? So you may actually just inflate one of these deltoid fibers, and that may look like a subacromial space right there, right where my arrow is. And it's not. I'm going to zoom. I'm going to show one thing on the subdeltoid because I think it's super, super important and I didn't get around to it on the slides. Now, if you turn your transducer short axis this way, now we're looking where the fibers are coming at the screen, right? And say my needle came in this way. You can see my, my finger blanched the skin on the left side of the screen. Well, I'm zoomed in, so it's a little less a little less prominent, but we're going to pretend my fingers coming in on the left side of the screen. Um, as our patient slowly internally and externally rotates, you can see that the subacromial space is moving with the tendon and that subdeltoid fascia is not. So let's relax right across the belly. There we go. And if you were to throw your needle in this way, you would go screen left to right. Uh, turn that caliper off. I'm going to freeze with this shot here. Caliper. Let's say this was your needle trajectory starting right up here, and then you inject right across here. And it can even be posterior to anterior. Your, your needle brings um, the injection over the whole bursal interface. And you'll see the, um, the anterior, or sorry, the, the posterior to anterior spread of the injection instead of just one fluid ball buildup right there. Uh, that's really important to see the injectate spread all the way throughout that subacromial space. You really don't want to see it blister up in one spot. And blistering up in one spot is exactly what can happen if you just rely on the long axis injection here. If you're going to do the long axis injection here, um, check short axis to make sure it's not a blister. If it's a blister, you, you'd probably just hit one of those um, deeper fibers in the deltoid. I thought that should have been maybe explained on uh, uh, after the slides since we didn't get around to that. But I think that concludes, geez, way over time. Yeah, we're really definitely over that. time. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but yeah, it looks like there's no other uh, questions. And uh, you know, like we said, this is a, a very comprehensive look uh, at the shoulder. Uh, so uh, just a reminder, since this was a really quick presentation, uh, if you need to review the slides or any of the live demonstrations, uh, the, web, uh, the webinar will be available on the Sonosite Institute and on the main page as well. Uh, so uh, thank you all for joining us today and uh, we really appreciate it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. Thank you, everybody. Have a great day.